session and then uh, we will have um, the four speakers that are going to talk today and because we just have one hour i think it's better that we uh, try to start on time to allow us to have some time for discussion so well welcome to this session my name is lola ray i'm a lecturer in water policy and economics at cranfield university and this session is about building resilience to hydrometeorological hazards in southeast asia um, and this session um, or we organized this session in the framework of a research program uh, with the same name or similar name that is understanding uh, the impacts of hydrometeorolog hydrometeorological hazards in Southeast Asia. And the idea of this research program uh, was to increase the resilience of uh, to these hazards by a better understanding of the impacts uh, in those different countries. So there was these five parallel collaborative research programs between the UK and different countries in Southeast Asia. Uh, so at the moment, there are three or four projects currently uh, in each country uh, with a total budget of around three million per country and the projects run for three years. So I'm part of a project working on droughts and agriculture in Thailand, and we are still working on it. And the project will finish at the end of this year. So the research that uh, is going to be uh, presented today is uh, very much um, work in progress in many cases. And uh, the projects that we are going to be um, uh, hearing about today are focused on Thailand and Malaysia. So in this presentation, in this session, sorry, we have four speakers um, coming from different institutions in the UK and also Malaysia. And uh, each of them are working on a different research project uh, as part of this uh, research program in Southeast Asia. So first of all, we have Simon de Sterk that is from the, from the Imperial College London. And he's going to talk about leptospirosis risks uh, from hydrometeorological patterns under climate change. And his work look at um, this risk in different countries around the world, but then focus on Malaysia. And then we have Balkis Mohamed Rehan from University Putra, Malaysia. Um, that is uh, going to talk to, to us about a comparison of national and international derived flood damage functions in flood vulnerability assessment. And she's going to be focusing on Malaysia. And then we have Jessica Penny from Exeter University in the UK um, talking about uh, future agricultural land use change in the Moon River Basin in Thailand. And finally, Simon Parry uh, from the from CEH in the UK that is working um, in the STAR project with me, uh, and he's going to be talking about strengthening Thailand's agricultural drought resilience. So the idea is that each of the of the speakers will have around eight minutes to present. Then we will have a bit of time to ask some questions to each of the speakers after each talk. And finally, hopefully, we'll have some time for final discussion in case anyone else wants to ask any questions or any general uh, discussion points that you want to raise. But that will be depending on any technical issues we have and how long the, the different talks take. Uh, but I hope that we can have some questions at the end. So just to mention that this session is being shared by myself and also Professor Slobodan uh, Georgievich from the University of Exeter. Um, and he's going to be the one moderating the questions. So if you have any questions for the speakers, please uh, write them down in the um, chat that you have on the right hand side. And then uh, Slobodan will be uh, asking some of those questions to the speakers on your behalf. And if you have any technical issues, please uh, there, talk to them. Um, uh, to the organizing committee. There are some people here um, that are going to be able to help you with that. Um, Slobodan, perhaps you want to say a few words about yourself and your research before we make a start? Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and welcome to uh, this session, which according to my screen, we now have 34 people in the room, which is a very good turnout. 
Um, well, Dolores introduced everyone, including myself, really. So I work for University of Exeter in the United Kingdom. I'm part of um, one of the projects presented today, and I'll have a great pleasure of moderating this session. So let's start with the program. So the first speaker is Simon from Imperial College London. So Simon, over to you. Thank you. I'll set up my screen share. There we go. Okay, this should be working. So, uh, good day, fellow speakers and members of the audience. My name is Simon de Sterke. I'm currently a postdoctoral research associate at Imperial College London. I will talk to you today about what related disease, which you may or may not already know, called leptospirosis, and how weather patterns affect the future risk of infection with this disease. But before that, I wish to introduce to you the broader project that I'm involved in. Its acronym is UNDERWRITE, and it stands for Understanding and Managing the Risks of Water-Related Diseases Under Hydrometeorological Extremes. Just like the other projects presented on in this session, it is funded by NERC and the Newton Fund to manage the impact of hydrometeorological hazards in Southeast Asia. The ultimate aim of the project is to have a predictive model for leptospirosis risk using AI based on socio-environmental and hydrometeorological parameters. We consider all components of the three-part risk framework and rely on a variety of primary and secondary data. The core case study comprises a number of states in Malaysia. The project team covers several disciplines from two universities in Malaysia and one in the UK. The center of gravity of hydrology, both in terms of modeling as well as monitoring, leans towards the UK side, while Malaysia is pulling most of the epidemiological and machine learning weight. Now, I've mentioned leptospirosis a number of times, but perhaps you, just like I, when I started working on this project, have never heard of the disease. The diagram on the left here contains all the basics. The thing causing the disease is a spiral-shaped bacterium of the genus Leptospira. They spend all of their early life in hosts, most commonly rats, where they reproduce. The most common way for the bacteria to leave the rat is through their urine, and this earns the disease the nickname Kenching Tikus in Malay, which means rat pee. The urine can infect humans directly through so-called mucous membranes, lungs and wounds, but also indirectly, because the bacteria can survive in soils and water for up to several weeks. It is via water that a lot of infections take place and incidences have been observed to peak after flooding where people are vulnerable and where they are in contact with water. However, certain professions such as rice farmers are also at higher risk and the disease is increasingly contracted in re recreational settings such as here in the Jiram Toy Park within our case study geography. In the rest of the presentation, I will be talking about the hydrometeorological component of infection risk. Now, the simplest causal mechanism based on observations is that rain causes leptospirosis. However, based on what we just learned about leptospirosis, we can refine this. So rain increases soil moisture and creates runoff. The moisture or more saturated the soil is, the more runoff is created. Now, moist soils are thought to benefit survival rates of leptospira after they are shed by their host. And when the soil then saturates, those bacteria enter water bodies and get distributed to establish a wider presence in the environment. It is this which constitutes the hydrological risk component of infection risk. In order to test this mechanism, I took a historical perspective. I extracted soil moisture, precipitation and discharge data from global gridded data sets that are in the public domain. In my analysis, discharge serves as a proxy for runoff. I looked for reports of incidence rates over time and linked that to plausible geographical boundaries, case study by case study, as is illustrated on the right. I then averaged the gridded hydrometeorological data over the geographical unit of the case study and then took the mean, minimum and maximum over the time unit of the case reporting. And this time unit is either a week or a month. So far, I've collected 14 case studies, which you can see on the world map here. It is definitely not exhaustive, but already shows interesting results and variation. 
Now, with those data that I collected, I constructed a statistical model for inference, but it could potentially also be used for a first order prediction. This model that I use is a generalized linear model of the Poisson family. This means that the expected number of cases per week or per month, supposedly following a Poisson distribution, is expressed as a linear combination of the independent variables as shown here, after taking the logarithm. Apart from a constant int intercept, there are four distinct groups of terms on the right-hand side. The first is precipitation, then there's discharge, then soil moisture, and finally, I also include an interaction term between soil moisture and discharge. Each group consists of a number of lagged values in my analysis three, meaning three weeks or months. So what the model actually does is to find a relationship between occurrence rates of leptospirosis and the weather over the preceding three months or weeks. Now, in order to get a sense of the contribution of each of the variables, I included them one by one in different orders, so as to get a sense of how much information each adds and the significance of that addition. Now, this colorful graph here shows seven different, seven different ways of building up the Poisson regression model, adding terms one by one, starting from the bottom. On the y-axis is a measure of how much the variability in the case data is explained by the model. The case study shown here is for a county in China called Yilong. The graph shows that if only one variable is used, discharge explains case rates better than precipitation and then soil moisture. And this is because the bottom block in all of the columns is greatest for discharge. Looking at the third and fourth columns, soil moisture explains more than this precipitation once discharge is already taken into account. And this is a corroboration of the causal mechanism I posited and indicates that there, the importance of hydrology beyond meteorology. However, the model performs poorly on some other case studies, such as the one for Walewaichu district in Argentina. Very little of the deviance in cases is explained by hydrometeorological variables, and only for precipitation is this barely statistically significant as seen by the single stars in the first two columns. Now, looking at the model's prediction power, where I took the first 80% of the time series as training data, we can see that the results for Yilong are sensible. The three waves of infection at the end are predicted with a consistent order, so greatest, small, and smaller. It also must be borne in mind here that the Poisson regression model presupposes an underlying stochastic process, so one would never expect to see a perfect match. In this graph, I also show the forms of the variables that I use in the title, which are the best fitting ones. So for soil moisture and discharge, this is the maximum daily value over the course of a month. And as was to be expected, the prediction for Walewaichu performs quite poorly, and this may be due to a blend of data and mechanism-related factors. Now, tying all of this together, I wanted to show that there are significant effects from weather, soil, and water on infection risk, but that there are differentials across case studies. In many of the case studies, the extremes of the hydrological variables are most highly correlated with case rates. Now, looking at the future, this indicates that infection risk would increase with climate change, that future precipitation patterns need to be understood, and that they need to be put through appropriate hydrological models to get a sense of the future value of predictors of interest. And finally, to close, I want to look back to the Underwrite project more broadly, because the research I presented is only a part of it. The team in Malaysia have been collecting primary and secondary data on exposures as well, and have been building predictive models that take into account all the data. The next steps are to hopefully conduct a survey that, that's been on hold because of the pandemic and to integrate monitoring. I'm eager for you to get in touch, to speak more about the project and to exchange ideas, and I look forward to the other presentations and discussions here. Simon, that's excellent. Thanks very much. Um... I'm not seeing any questions for you yet. Probably people need, another, well, those of us who are still in breakfast time, we need another coffee. Anyway, I'll kick off with questions. Uh, you mentioned three months as sort of a time step in the, in the analysis. So have you tried uh, some sort of sensitivity analysis uh, to see what would, if you would get different results if you worked with, I don't know, two months or four months or, or, or some other? or different time step? 
In other words, how you came up with three months? Um, three months is, is basically the three time units. I think I, I didn't perform a formal sensitivity analysis, but this was um, a good enough. Well, I, I found this to be a good trade off between uh, taking into account lots of variables and then taking into account, um, yeah, not, not overfitting the model. Um, why three? It's because certain case studies have, uh, are, are on a weekly basis. And so those three time steps uh, would, would overlap with the incubation period for, um, for leptospirosis to, to show up. So I wanted to, um, also because when, when, the, when the time unit is one month, it's not clear where, whether the cases were reported at the beginning of the month or the end of the month. So I wanted to capture that as well. Okay, great. So it's good to hear that, well, there's been quite some thinking behind that choice of three months. Uh, we have a question from the audience, why, from Professor Baba. Why all cases are performed differently? Um, I don't know. That's the next thing to, to figure out. So uh, obviously, um, this might have to do with, with data because um, often the, the cases are reported for a hospital and it's not ne necessarily clear where they actually occurred. So, for example, for Wale Wai Chu, I took the administrative boundary of the region, but um, and, and, and based the, the extraction of the hydrometeorological data on that, but the cases might have actually occurred elsewhere, and that's not clear from the data. Yilong is a much larger province, so it's more likely that the cases occurred actually there. So that's one possibility that, that explains it. The other, um, the other explanation might be due to the fact that maybe hydrology doesn't play an important part there because um, people can also contract leptospirosis from um, yeah, if, if there's a lot of rats around and, and um, they live in an environment where there's a lot of um, well, bacteria around just on surfaces and, and, and so forth or, or, or in mm -hmm. water that they drink. So, so uh, this is something, this differential is something that uh, we'll look at in the next steps. Excellent. Okay. So Simon, thanks very much for your presentation and for very clear answers to the questions from the audience. So we'll move on now. Uh, so, the next speaker is Balkis from University Putra in Malaysia, so over to you. Thank you, uh, Prof. Uh, let me share my screen first. Okay, um, hello everyone. So uh, I will be presenting to you um, a small part of uh, the big project, uh, a Newton grant project, which entitled Comparison of uh, National and International Derived Blood Damage Functions. So this is a Malaysia case study. So uh, the study is part of the big project as mentioned earlier. Um, so the project is entitled Flood Impacts Across Scales. Um, so under the project, we have uh, one work package that looks at uh, exposure and vulnerability assessment, uh, and this work is um, associated with that work package. Um, so this specific work is uh, trying to understand um, uh, the exposure um, uh, and vulnerability aspects. Uh, so to, if you look at the aim there, so we aim to explore the uncertainty from uh, national and international damage functions in microscale flood exposure and vulnerability assessment in Malaysia. Um, so as we know um, that an accurate representation of vulnerability has been one of the largest uncertainty source in flood risk assessment. Uh, different scales and special units are some of the features of flood damage model that makes them inherently uncertain. Uh, and also uh, limited studies have yet looked at the resulting discrepancies of flood damage model in micro scale flood damage and risk assessment. Uh, the figure on the right hand side shows um, a simple illustration on how uh, and the approach that uh, we adopt for the uh, for the work um, so using exposed asset uh, values of the assets and also flood scenarios we, we we then quantify the aggregated losses for the range of uh, maximum water level that can happen uh, for, for that specific study area so we, we, we specifically look at the uh, local information such as uh, building distribution uh, and also the, the land use map. 
So the left hand side figure, as you can see here, it shows a more detailed flows of the work undertaken. So we use a national damage function and international damage function. So the national damage function is referring to the Department of Irrigation and Drainage, in short, uh, DID. So that uh, stands for the national derived function. And the international derived function is the GRC function, uh, which is quite uh, a, a well known, a famous uh, in the European, European countries. So we tested these two different uh, function in our exposure and vulnerability assessment. Uh, the two uh, we used with appropriate parameter values for residential and commercial losses. So we only targeted two different elements at risk, which is residential and commercial, as can be seen on the table on the right hand side. So these are the input values that we used uh, in uh, establishing our damage curve. Um, so uh, the information of exposure on the other hand on the left hand side back to the left hand side again you can see that we have a primary data there so with the uh, uh, conventional way uh, to extract the exposure information we overlay the uh, land use map and aerial imagery and the DEM uh, and then uh, we extract the distribution of houses and delineate polygons of land uses so but, so as you can see that we have a uh, we have different um, uh, spatial unit for the different damage function. One is using the uh, building level uh, impact, direct impact, and another one is po polygon level. So polygon means that we delineate polygons based on the, the land use uh, information. So um, yeah, basically uh, we would like to compare in the end the aggregated losses given uh, the scenarios of flooding uh, for a range of uh, maximum water level as our uh, independent function. So here uh, to show you the um, what's the results from our, the quanti quantitative analysis. As you can see there, um, we have uh, figures on the left. It's referring to the Department of Irrigation and Drainage Damage Function. That's the national one. And GRC is referring to the international function. Uh, so we cannot see much difference uh, in terms of the, the magnitude. We cannot compare uh, uh, because they, both of them are using a different spatial unit. One is building and another one is uh, the polygon. Comparing between the two is the figure uh, at the bottom, uh, which titled stage damage, DID and GRC. So we can see that there's huge uh, significant difference between the two when the maximum water level reached uh, three meters above the, the first uh, elevation when flood, uh, the damage and flood impact, which is eight meter of datum. So three meters above eight meters, uh, we compare the values. The difference is 187%, which is uh, extremely high. Uh, in terms of Ringgit uh, Malaysia, so we, we found that uh, uh, the GRC model gives around RM43 million uh, when water level reaches three, three meters above the, the uh, lowest the, the, the threshold and um, two million uh, for the GRC. So in conclusion, uh, the quantitative analysis shows that there's large differences as, as been shown uh, in previous slides. So this actually uh, is, is expected so because it reflects the different configuration of the model itself. And the study shows that GRC model produces higher estimates of flood losses due to the fact that it assigns high maximum damage value and a steeper curve. And the output from the analysis was similar with the previous study where the GRC overestimates the damage value. So uh, such studies uh, highlight importance of local knowledge in flood risk assessment, especially when uh, we are aiming to do a micro scale level uh, flood damage in preparing for flood risk assessment, in preparing for decision making of flood protection. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus. <clears throat> nice presentation. So. We have some questions from the audience, again prof from Professor Babel. So the question is, have you collected local data to validate your results? Uh, 
Thank you for, for the question. Uh, actually, yes, we've collected some local information, but it's not presented here. Um, and we, we found that uh, the, the, the site-specific derived function or empirical derived function is similar to the national standard function. It's not that much difference in, uh, in terms of site-specific and the, the national average function. Uh -huh. um, okay, may I ask you another question? So one problem in uh, the analysis that you were describing, one typical problem is uh, if your flood model resolution is relatively large and you have the information about buildings uh, mm -hmm. where you might have buildings relatively close to each other with only a few meters between them. Uh, in your, well, GIS data, you might uh, not be able to avoid the fact that two or even more than two buildings are merged into one because the passage between them is not captured by the resolution of, of your data. Did you, have you come across that problem and how you dealt with that? Do you mean the, the DEM resolution or the... Well, DEM or whatever we like to call it, DEM or, or DTM. Uh, if you have buildings that are close to each other, then the mm -hmm. problem is that if the, the passage between them is not captured by your terrain model or, or uh, elevation model, uh, then those two buildings are merged. And then if they are of different type, then... Yeah, you... yeah, of course. Hmm. Yeah, that's, I think that's that's a very important thing to to to, to point out because uh, that's why I think ground truthing is quite important in this uh, type of study. So we actually we tried to go to that place and try to verify ourselves the locations of the buildings and whether or not they are you know two houses rather than one house, things like that. So we try our best to capture those information. Yeah, the only trouble is if you do that in a big city, then you need to, uh, to do that for all of them. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's very difficult. <laughs> okay, excellent. Thanks very much for great presentation and uh, clear answers. So we now, we now move on to the next one, which is Jessica Penny from University, from University of Exeter. Jess, over to you. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen one moment. Uh, okay. So, right, thank you, Doki. So, my name's Jessica, and I'm going to be talking to you about the Enrich project and specifically the land use changes within the Mun River Basin. So, just a little bit of background to this the um, project. So, the first objective was to gather and process data on the recent land use changes within the Mun and also then to create a series of possible land use scenarios within the basin. So the Mun River Basin is located in the southeast catchment of Thailand. So you can just see this over here on the left hand side. Um, and the area is predominantly agriculture. So it's actually a really important source of livelihoods and income for the people there to survive. Um, if you look at the right hand picture, you can see that the majority of the catchment is paddy field. This is seen in yellow. Um, however, between the years 2008 and 2017, we're beginning to see a change in crops. So we're beginning to see field crops, which is seen in pink, and also perennial and orchard style crops, which is seen in purple. So the methods we use, we use two models um, to the to model the land use change. We chose Dynaclu and Flues. So I was mainly focusing on the Flues model. A colleague of mine was focusing on the Dynaclu model. So we chose these two models mainly because they were um, quite similar in the way that um, they model land use. They can use a number of top down and bottom up factors. This was really important for our case study due to the high flexibility in data. Um, the, the case study itself was actually quite data limiting um, so it's quite hard to find specific data we needed but so it was really good to have this flexibility um, however they were also quite different so how they looked at the competition between different land uses was fairly different so the Dynaclu use so-called methods such as a conversion elasticity and a conversion matrix whereas the flues model used a weight and neighborhood and a cost matrix the key difference here was that the flues model also used a roulette wheel. 
So this was to, this basically looks at probability of a different land use occurring. So if you can imagine a pie um, and you have each land use has a probability of having a section of pie, the land use with the largest probability of occurring will have a larger segment of pie and the one with the smallest probability of occurring will have a smaller bit of pie but still has a chance of occurring. So this, these are the two models we used um, and we chose uh, eight driving factors um, and these were mainly chosen due to what was already been used in literature but also because of what was available to use for the case study. Um, so, so this is the scenarios we chose. So we had seven different scenarios in the end. So we had a business of usual scenarios. This was based upon a Markov chain. Um, the second scenario was a conservation scenario. So this was with the ultimate aim to reach 25% um, forest cover by 2050. Um, we then had a productivity scenario. So this scenario was based upon a map that was given us by LDD, which was the Land Development Department in Thailand. And this basically looks at the land suitability. Um, and the land suitability is actually more suitable for growing crops such as perennials and field crops rather than paddy fields. So the idea here was that this scenario would reach that 45% by 2060. We then had a um, increased urban growth area known as the economic scenario. And this was where urban growth changed um, depending on which decade it was. We then um, came up with three other scenarios. So these were based on a midterm stakeholder workshop, which we had um, in January 2020 at the at AIT. Um, it was a joint stakeholder workshop between Enrich and Star. There's a little picture on the side there, so you may see some faces that you recognise. Um, and from here, we came up with three other scenarios. So we had a combination scenario. So this was a multi-objective um, scenario based upon the conservation and the economic growth scenario, where both of those objectives had to be met. We then had a policy-driven scenario. So um, in Thailand, they have um, like government elections every five years. So the idea here was that um, every five years, the land use policy would change. And from there, we would choose a different scenario based on the five previous ones. Um, and then the last one was a water stress scenario. So here we actually added three additional drivers. So we added temperature, precipitation and soil moisture. So those were our seven scenarios. The only three I'm going to talk about today is the business as usual, the conservation and the economic. So these are our results. So as you can see um, in the left hand picture here, Compared to 2007, for all different scenarios, we have a decrease in paddy field and we have an increase in field crop and perennial growth um, by 2050. So the, this is shown in the pink and the purple. So field crop is pink and perennial is in purple and the paddy field is yellow. So you can see a, a significant decrease here. Um, as expected, if I can find my curve uh, here, um, in the economic scenario, we have an increase in urban area. And in the conservation scenario, we have an increase in forest area, which is seen in green. Key differences here was that in the economic scenario for Dynaclu, where this urban area has increased significantly, we've had quite a decrease in the forest area. And this wasn't seen in the flues. So if I then go over to my coral plot, so this is showing the correlation between the Dynaclu and flues results. So we can see from here, we have no negative correlation between the results, which is good. It means the models are showing similar results. However, we have got quite a discrepancy anyhow. So you can see that in between the, diff the models themselves, we have a uh, that the similarity between the results has improved, whereas um, in between results, um, the similarity is quite more significant, especially for this Dynaclu economic um, scenario, which you can see that it disagrees quite highly with the flu's results. OK, so this is looking at the actual maps. So at the top here, we have our business as usual results. And down here, we have the economic results. And here we have our conservation results. So all three of our results show that we are having a decreasing paddy field area towards the east of the catchment. And this is replaced by an increase in field crop area, which is encroaching towards the centre of this catchment here. 
um, for the urban area here. This is the um, economic scenario. We can see that we've got an increase in urban area in this urban area in the west here. Um, and we can see this slightly more, slightly, but less in the Dynaclear result in here. Um, we can actually see that this forested area here has now turned urban, whereas in the flues result here, we can see that it is still um, a, well, it's still a forest. Key differences in this result as well is that in the flues result, we have urban area spreading out from these little centers here, whereas for here, we see that urban is encroaching around the center bit, around this bit here. Another result, key result here is this perennial extent. So in all results, we can see for the flues that it is in the southeast catchment, whereas for the Dynaclue, we can see it is around the central, central bit here and here. So why did this happen? So then we looked at the influences of our driving factors. So on the left here, we have the results for the Dynaclue, and on the right, we have um, the results for the flus. So if we specifically look at perennial, which is where the key differences was, you can see that drainage was the key driver for Dynaclue for perennials. Whereas look, if we look at elevation, um, elevation is the key driver for perennials and field crops. So if we then look at these maps down here, so this is your map for drainage and this is your map for elevation. So if we go back to the previous map where we saw that perennials were found in the central catchment here, we can see that this is associated with a good drainage. Whereas if we look previously again, we can see for the flues model here, here and here and here, we can see that it, it is found in these bottom areas of the highest elevation. We can also see from both maps that paddy field isn't associated with elevations actually negatively and it's found in the areas of lowest elevation which is along the riverfront. So in conclusion um, both models acted really really improved where well, the kappa coefficients um, proved to be um, very good. There were slight improvements with the, um, uh, with the flues model um, but not significantly. All our results found a decrease in paddy extent, and, and this was associated with a decreased elevation. Main discrepancies were seen in perennial um, and orchards um, with different drivers because of this. Um, both of the models required quite a significant setup. However, um, our analysis um, due to um, how input data um, was converted we believe that Fluid is actually an easier model to use. It uses a more GIS based, whereas um, Dynaclue is a more ASCII format. Um, so current outputs, we have two papers under review at the moment. Um, so this um, work was supported by the YCDT and the Enrich project. And I'd like to thank um, all of those involved, especially for their, uh, especially the AIT team for their support and providing all the data required to complete the study. Um, thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Jess. So we have a question from the audience from you for you uh, by Christina v Vijaya. V Vijaya, apologies for mispronunciation. So could you please quickly explain how Dynaclue and Fluss models are calculated to provide those maps? Um, calculated. Um, do you mean calibrated? In the question, it says calculated. Calculated. Uh, or you, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, a bit more about them. Used. Okay. So, um, basically, um, so I didn't use the Dynaclue um, model, but I can tell you about the flues model. So, for flues, um, basically, um, you do everything in GIS. So, you set up a number of different um, maps, which are going to be your driving factors. Um, and these have to have the specific number of columns and resolutions. So it has to all look the same or will have the same spatial dimensions and resolution. Um, so once you've got your number of driving factors, you then have to get a previous, well, at least two previous land use maps. So then in your input, you have a probability map. So prior to running the model, you have a probability um, map which basically you put in as many land use maps as you possibly can and it takes and then you put that into the model and then you run it with the driving factors and then that produces um, 
a map for you which looks at each of the probability each of the driving factors and their probability of creating a new how the land use has changed so then when you run the model you input that map in and you have your future you get your future um land use um requirements which are when you're calibrating the model are the ones that you already know it's going to be um and then you the cost matrix and the weight of neighborhood so the cost matrix um is basically um it's a binary code one or zero um to be whether or not the land use can change into um a different land use or not so for example urban can't change into anything else but urban and we had quite a few restrictions on ours so for example we didn't want the forest area to decrease um there's a few um forest restrictions in thailand which means that the forested area can't decrease so um that was another restriction so the forest area couldn't change into anything Thank you, Jess. I believe this is one of those things that cannot really be explained in one or two minutes. We have one more question for you. How did you, from uh, Zriab Babker, Babker uh, how did you select the driving factors that you mentioned, what they were, uh, as some has more effect than the other, which could affect the calibration of the model? So the driving factors were primarily um, decided upon um, by which ones were most commonly used in literature and actually what data was available as, for us to use. Um, which was more the key issue when we were deciding which driving factors to use. Like you can use a number of different ones. It was just mainly on data availability. Um, which ones affect the calibration? Um, so we actually found that let me, that the, the ones that affected the calibration more tended to be um, so drainage and elevation. So quite a few of the driving factors we got from LDD, which was based upon the soil type and soil suitability. Um, and I think this was one of the main outputs that we had, was that, um, okay, so Thailand is mainly, a, a mo most of the farmers there use paddy fields um, as a source of income because it's a guaranteed um, income for them. That doesn't mean that it's actually suitable for um, having, the, having paddy fields grown on it. So, what I'm trying to say is, is that all our soil based ones didn't actually affect the driving factor, didn't drive the land use because um, they're kind of disconsidered um, because they don't, people want to grow paddy fields. They'll grow paddy fields even though the paddy fields aren't necessarily the most suitable crop of choice. So we found that, um, so out of our driving factors, um, we had um, we had soil type suitability um and drainage so though drainage did prove to be a key factor like we had quite a few that were based on the actual soil and those didn't appear to be very good driving factors just that... yeah that that answers the question in a given time so thank you very much for the presentation and for the answers so we are now going to move on to the last one which is simon parry from um center for ecology and hydrology in the united kingdom simon over to you Thanks, Slobodan. Um, and uh, let me just share my screen. Okay, good. Um, so, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name's Simon Parry. I'm a hydrologist at the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. Uh, and I'm the project leader of the STAR project, or, or to give it its full title, Strengthening Thailand's Agricultural Drought Resilience. I'd like to thank the session conveners today for providing the opportunity to introduce the project. And, and whilst it's me standing up here today uh, to represent the project, it's part of a much uh, larger collaboration. Um, uh, the activities wouldn't be possible without this fantastic team of collaborators in, the th in Thailand and the UK. Um, and too many to mention individually, but um, the leaders of the institute, their institutions' involvement, um, Sapatra Vasesri, uh, Chai Wat, Eka Wat Panit, and Liwa Padthe Song, as well as Lola Ray, uh, have been particularly crucial in establishing a strong collaboration between partners. Uh, the objectives of STAR are fourfold um, and map onto four work packages uh, that, will, that will follow. Um, 
So first, STAR has a, star has a strong commitment to engaging stakeholders, stakeholders throughout the life cycle of the project um, and beyond uh, the, but beyond the end of the project as well. Um, and second, the second objective is to co-develop um, stakeholder relevant drought metrics that better reflect the needs of water users um, in the case three catchment and beyond. Uh, thirdly, to develop a more comprehensive understanding of the impacts of drought on agriculture and farmers' ability to adapt in order to mitigate the worst of these impacts. And the final objective is to draw together um, these advances in understanding around drought indicators and drought impacts to enhance monitoring, communication and management of drought risk. So the early activities of work package one um, sought to establish a network of key stakeholders within um, within the catchment and, and more widely within Thailand um, to provide a sounding board throughout the project um, for continued engagement. Um, and as, as in many countries, there are a multitude of different parties with a stake in drought management and the stakeholder mapping activities were key in establishing in enabling the project team to uh, understand the associations between these different organizations and actors, uh, as well as the flows of information um, during times of drought. And the mapping exercise um, in task 1.1 um, identified some of the key stakeholders um, that we needed to engage with, um, without whom the project would be unable to achieve the desired long term impacts. Um, and these stakeholders form the basis of the network that was established in 1.2. <clears throat> the final activity of Work Package 1 was a review of existing practices in Thailand, um, which is a necessity to, to understand the current state of the art in Thailand and address any niches um, that exist. Uh, and through stakeholder engagement, discussions were held to discuss the um, strengths and weaknesses of current practices and identify new opportunities and the findings have fed through to further activities in work packages two three and four um, and we've written up some of these in a uh, in the first of a series of um, policy briefs which uh, which we call these star sheets second work package um, predominantly focuses on uh, an improved assessment of hydrometeorological and agricultural drought in thailand um, and our our partners in thailand have been working closely with key stakeholders to source data from a dense observation network um, of rainfall and river flows for the country um, we've also been sourcing remote sensing data sets um, from from global satellite products um, and then we've been applying a range of stakeholder co-develops drought metrics um, shaped by focus groups that we've held in the country um, and more on that to follow in a second um, and generated a, a wide range of drought indicators uh, and these will be archived on a dedicated database to be made available um, beyond the end of the project um, and their exploration will be facilitated by the development of interactive tools um, to, to explore these different, um, to zoom in, zoom out, and explore these different indicators in some more detail. To talk uh, in more detail about the focus groups, um, we held our, held the first ones in Chiang Mai in January 2020, um, and they're crucial for drawing stakeholders into discussions around the most appropriate drought metrics for adequate drought characterization. Um, and for bridging what's currently provided at the national scale with more local scale needs. Um, and we've had a strong attendance at these at these discussions of stakeholders from um, from a diverse range of backgrounds. And the information that we've gleaned from these events um, has suggested you know, exploring different indicators that we hadn't previously considered. Uh, and here's just uh, just a brief example of that, um, looking at um, building on the feedback that we got that uh, combined drought indicators are are of interest then um, looking at a range of different combined drought indicators. Work package three focuses on how farmers are impacted by drought and their ability to adapt uh, in order to, to mitigate against the worst impacts. Um, 
And the key mechanism for this, the work within Work Package 3, has been interviewing 180 farmers from 12 different villages across four sub-districts of the, of the Ping case study basin in the north of Thailand. Um, and it, those farmers were, were selected to encompass a broad and representative cross-section of agriculturalists in the, in the basin. And preliminary findings suggest um, livestock farmers are more vulnerable than crop farmers. Uh, and that irrigation reduces the impact of drought. Um, advice alongside warnings was was viewed as critical for, ad for adaptation of farmers, as opposed to just providing the warnings alone. Um, and wealth is a key constraint to the ability to adapt. Uh, but as I say, these findings are preliminary and further work to be, to be conducted uh, and written up. <coughs> The final work package I won't go into too much detail on, um, it's going to be shaped by the outcomes of work packages two and three, uh, which are in progress, uh, but the aim is to draw together those uh, advances on indicators and impacts in those two previous work packages uh, towards a, a more thorough understanding of how drought propagates from rainfall shortage to affect lives and livelihoods. <clears throat> and this work will build on um, novel indicator impact approaches um, with, which, with which the project team has a lot of experience from previous uh, applications in Europe and the US. Uh, a quick uh, a quick slide on stakeholder engagement and the fantastic in-country engagement that we were able to do prior to, to the pandemic, um, including workshops and focus groups, uh, interviews with farmers and, and guest lectures at universities um, these visits to Thailand are really critical to delivering the planned impacts of the project uh, and we're hopeful that such visits can resume uh, at, the, at the appropriate time. So finally, just to conclude on some, on some future plans, um, as I mentioned, the, in the absence of visits to Thailand, we'll be moving forward with the next round of stakeholder engagement um, remotely, um, either entirely remotely or or having in-person events in Thailand with remote UK involvement. Um, work packages two and three will advance to their conclusion and that will allow work package four to continue uh, within an indicated impact framework. Uh, and we're hopeful that the final events can go ahead um, most likely now in 2022. So thanks, uh, thanks for the invitation and uh, thanks for your time today. Excellent. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, we are still awaiting questions for you. Um, in the meantime, well, perhaps I can reinforce what you said, that the engagement of local stakeholders in Thailand, which, which was also the experience on our English project, was really excellent. Um, better than in some other parts of the world. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> uh, could you tell us, okay, we have a question for you. So from Timothy Lam, have you looked into satellite observation, observations and plant-based drought indicators such as chlorophyll fluorescence or NDVI? Yes, yeah, yeah, we've been, um, we've, I mean, we're very fortunate in Thailand and uh, we have a very good working relationship with key stakeholders in country that we've been able to source a lot of observed data from the, from the map that I showed there. Um, but we've also been exploring the potential for remote sensing data sets um, of which NDVI is one. Um, and rather, rather than looking at NDVI um, uh, independently, we've been using it within the combined indicators that I, that I demonstrated on one of those slides there. So um, NDVI is, um, what is the component of that combined drought indicator um, and, uh, and the drought severity index. So and it, we, this was important, I think, for based on the focus group discussions that we had, um, there was uh, we started to present some um, rainfall rainfall drought indicators, um, and uh, this was perceived as um, not taking the whole uh, hydrological cycle into account, and really the need to it's it's more than just uh, the rainfall deficit, um, of course, uh, and we need to more fully appreciate uh, vegetation drought um, and soil moisture drought. So that that required us to look at remote sensing data sets where these where these observed data aren't, aren't available. So yes, uh, I can't provide any uh, any of the results immediately on NDVI, but um, we've been using that for sure. 
Okay. Um, could you tell us if you have more specific plans or scenarios of depending on how the pandemic situation will evolve? Uh, do you foresee that by the end of the project you would be able to visit Thailand again and do some work there? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's certainly that's certainly the hope. Um, um, I mean, we'll be we'll be uh, we'll be having an extension of some sort to the project in the UK, and we've been exploring that for the Thailand partners as well. Um, I think this should be acceptable. Um, and yeah, the idea would be to push the push the final delivery date back into 2022. To obviously, this year is looking quite difficult just because of the lead times involved in organising stakeholder events and and the travel restrictions that are continuing um but yeah we're still still planning on that um on that um eventuality but of course making contingency plans uh in case that is uh, in case that's not possible and i mean the, the really the really great thing is that we've got a, a fantastic team of partners in thailand who um are certainly willing and able to hold events themselves um and with it with only remote participation from ourselves uh, and i'm very confident that those events would be successful if that is the the way things go yeah well good luck with that to us all <laughs> yeah <laughs> very good so with no further questions for you specifically simon i would like to open the floor for well any general discussion or comments um to any of the presenters or on the subject of hydrometeorological risks in Southeast Asia. I will have to ask a question while we wait for uh, participants to say something. And uh, it's a question for all the speakers, but um, yeah, perhaps more for Jessica and Valkis, because you've been presenting like um, different models or different methods to estimate something. And my question is then, with different models giving us different results or different answers, um, how can we then, as researchers, tra translate that into decision making? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Because if we have like different land use change uh, models or um, giving you different answers and the same for the flood damage, um how could we then um translate that into something that is useful for decision makers i know it's quite a difficult question but i just want to know your your opinion on that um okay um so the problem we had um it's not necessarily a problem but basically the flues and the Dynaclue model, um, the calibration was really good for both of them. Um, so the fact that the the results were fairly similar, bar for the perennial and orchard, which was the um, bit that was driven by drainage in one of them and then um, elevation in another. Um, I'm not really sure how, because they were quite different in that aspect, but um, from, what I've known, um, I know Dynaclue is the most commonly used model, so, um, and Flues isn't normally, it hasn't been as used as much. So I suppose if you're going by what people normally use, we'd probably go with what um, the Dynaclue model suggests. I mean, it's really hard, um, really hard question. <laughs> um, I mean, that you could potentially combine the results. Um, into a single map potentially, um, because most of the other uh, land uses agreed really well between the two um, maps. Um, one one of the things that could potentially be redone is the the resolution that we use for the Dynaclue model was different for the Flues model. So the Flues model used a much finer resolution um, than the Dynaclue model. Um, I think there were some issues making the resolution smaller, but perhaps if we either increase the resolution of the Flues model to match that of the Dynaclue, or we redid the simulations of the Dynaclue to a smaller resolution, potentially we might get better results that correlated, correlated, correlated more. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but 
Yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't know what the answer is, so that's that's good. Yeah, thanks. But it's very, very difficult. And as you said, if you were well lucky enough that one model was worse than the other, then you will go with the best one. But when they are quite similar in performance, it's a bit uh, difficult to make a decision, I guess. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, um, sorry, just, just to say something that I think I agree with what uh, Paddy said just now. Um, in our case, uh, flood damage assessments so or using like two alternative models, we can say, so generally we, we all agree that national ones or lo local derived function will, will perform better in the, in the um, estimations. So yeah, basically if we have the, that data available, we, we need to go uh, you need to use uh, what what what's what's best um, to represent the local um, local context to capture the local context. But I think uh, based on what Prof. Robertson mentioned just now, if we are targeting a larger area for the, for flood risk assessment, flood damage and risk assessment, certainly we need to to compromise between you know the accuracy of the estimates and the the computational time, for example, or time doing that research alone. So so probably we need to decide in the, in the sense that we have limited time um, to, to explore and the, uh, or to quantify the flood risk, for example. Um, yeah, I think that depends on uh, the, the context of the study. Okay, I believe we are running out of time, so I'm slowly going to draw this session to a close. I would like to thank all the presenters first. So, Bauk is just and the two Simons. Um, and we ended up with more people than the number we started with. So it probably means that the presenters did a good job in, in uh, showing interesting results, um, which justifies all the efforts and the investments and everything. Uh, it was really, really a pleasure to uh, moderate this session, session. So thank you all again very much. And thank you to the audience for asking interesting questions and hopefully we meet again on one of the latest sessions today and tomorrow so bye Thank you. Everyone. Hello to everyone. Bye.